Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm Jake Mara, and uh, I've been friends with Patricia. I met her early on in her recovery, and I've seen her just grow in the craziest ways. It's so impressive to see her put all this together, and yeah. just to see her become the person she is. It's been awesome. Yeah, so tonight we're here to celebrate the publication of Remember, and uh, just bought my copy right now. So you've known her a while. Yeah. Uh, how, have, how have you seen her grow and develop and change through the course of writing this book? Oh, for sure. Uh, through it, it's been simply put, I've seen her become an adult. That makes, okay. that makes sense. Uh, she's just the most responsible person I know. She said she's going to be someone. She's there. She is reliable. She's caring. She is a person who will show up for a time and time again because she will be the same. And it's, it's that type of person you'll meet up And so to see her go from a place where she was, you know, it was good. It yeah. was in a good, good place for her. And uh, now she's just remarkable. Yeah. And, uh, you know, all this stress putting this on the side, she's doing fantastic. So it's great, and it's great for me to see. This is kind of a crucible, right? <laughs> it is, it is. You have no idea. It's nuts. I can't even imagine how to put all this together. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, look at, look at it. This says it all. She yeah. wrote this book. Yeah. Uh, she has all these amazing people who come up to support her. They love her, and they obviously what she you know, stands for and everything that she's been about. It. I'm just honestly here now. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the creative process yeah. and how that intersects with mental health. For sure. Uh, so I'm a stand-up comedian. I also uh, host a pop-up game show on Instagram at the pop-up game show. Great. And uh, I have found comedy safe. Uh, stand-up yeah. specifically. I moved out to Los Angeles about eight years ago. I actually ruptured a couple of discs in my lower back when I was 19. So Big time surgery from that, and it was miserable. You know, I saw a lot of pain killers, uh, not fun stuff. Yeah. And in that time, I found comedy, and I found that I wanted to create. That creativity got me out of my head, if only for a moment. I think that's the real draw for some of these people struggle with it. addiction, depression, uh, pain, whatever it may be. Uh, creativity and the arts offer a way to get out of your head and create something as opposed to. Eight years, yeah. and it's a uh, it's a real set of yeah. yeah. what you think you've learned the most as part of becoming someone part of the entertainment industry, and is the entertainment industry good, supportive right? of people who have mental health challenges? Oh, like you know, like oh yeah, uh, I think frankly that it's still taboo to talk about certain things, in certain okay. circles always, but I think we're in a better place than ever. I think discussions out there, are more people in prominent positions about COVID. And I, you know, as somebody who knows a lot of people in entertainment, a lot of people deal with this. And it's the same thing that makes them great that makes them struggle. Uh, it's that drive, that total focus, that desire to do whatever it takes to get this uh, idea or you know negative side done. It's, it's this total commitment, and I think a lot of people are people. You know, that's the thing they still most people struggle with: like, addiction, depression. So, I think I think it's a normal thing, and not just life. Have you read Patricia's book yet? I've read I've read segments of it. I'm going to read the whole thing through. Uh, I'm going to go home, plot it now, and I'm like super excited because uh, uh, she hasn't let me read it until now. So <laughs> right. I'm ready to give. give You've been given permission. Yes, yes. Now <laughs> after this launch, I can give permission. And uh, I can't wait. I mean, it just it looks amazing. And frankly, I love that she is talking about depression, uh, uh, addiction, all these things that sometimes we sweep under the rug. Yeah, so she's giving a new product to them, and that's really important. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's, it's awesome for me to see her from when I first met her to be at this point where she was able to talk about all these things proudly, openly, no shame, because she shouldn't have. She should be proud of herself for all she's been through and all she's today. I'm very proud of her, so it's really kind of safe. 100%. Okay, where can people see you again? Just oh, absolutely. Uh, they can find me at uh, www.jakemarin.com or on Instagram at the Pop Up Game Show. Pop Up Game Show? Yeah, I do, right. I do a game show on the street and in elevators, bathrooms, wherever people are. You know? <laughs> on the beach, I'll be there. All right. Uh, Thanks, Jake. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Have a good one.
Nice. Yeah, okay, so now Tori Eldridge is going to be back for a quick take on Remember, that's Patricia Smith's book. So Tori, you've read it now. What do you think? I have. This book is so raw and vividly. It just, it just captured my attention. So I have to go back and tell you all the you know, I had connections, so I got to read it the best. Okay. Well, okay. Okay. The pages when I was reading it, like this, I have to find yes. out how the skiller is. So good. So good. And so what did you think about how um, the main character Portia has PTSD, extreme social anxiety? What did you think about that as a portrayal? Oh my gosh, it was so realistic. I mean, I felt it all. She really brought me to the process of the years of the personal lives. And it was very raw and emotional. So I met her all the twists and turns and things. They really grabbed me. Oh, so I'm assuming now that you are the author, author is you are going to be going through their careers together. I go, isn't this fun? I mean, a lot of books, they just launch a new book. I think they launch it. Yeah. I mean, that's really amazing. I mean, sure, she's a black author and she's a black woman. It's really about <laughs> this mental illness and this deep dive that she said to the betrayal and the uh, loss and yeah. all of these things. Yeah. And then you get me, you know. I mean, <laughs> I'm just a Hawaiian Chinese Norwegian writer, you know. How many of those are there? And I'm writing about a Chinese so, you know, there's it's entertaining. First and foremost, it's also so pretty. Oh, yeah. Yeah, right? So, technically, a serious issue. No, I'm like, I'm so happy. It's good. There's some dark stuff in there. There's a real deep dive into relationships and culture. So, it's coming from a book. Yeah. Yeah. How do you know we worked with Patricia at the counter. It was one of her first jobs. And we worked with her for like seven years. Um, she's like my daughter slash sister. I love that worker. And I'm so proud of how far she's come. And I can't wait to see what else she's going to do. And this is huge. So I'm here with Cherie, who is Patricia Smith's sister, and we're talking about family and the the devastating loss, um, devastating loss, and how one can recover from that. And and unfortunately, uh, maybe I'm asking you to repeat some things, but I think it was a good message. Could you, what did you have to say about that? I believe that everything has to be done with love. And I've had to learn that myself as well with experience such a traumatic loss of losing a parent at an early age. And I believe that you have to go through the trials and tribulations, but also spirituality helped me a lot as well to get through those dark moments because I felt that I had to channel my energy in a more positive direction. And I just really feel you know, bad for my sister not being able to experience the love of a mother. But I'm so inspired by her strength and her courage to do things that even most people with their mothers and fathers wouldn't be able to do. It's a fantastic and amazing accomplishment to write and publish a book. So I, she and you and the whole family can be very proud of that. Um, you mentioned the power of love. So you've been a part of her life for a really long time. And she talks openly about um, addiction, about depression, about mental health issues. And so you must have seen her go through a tremendous recovery. Yes. And I believe that sometimes you have to let your loved ones grow at their own pace. Because sometimes when you're looking from the outside, you don't really understand what someone is going through, no matter how attached you are to them or how close you are to, to them. I had to take a step back and realize that a lot of things that she experienced with not having the stronger bond with my mother, I had experienced those things. So I could not be selfish and expect more out of her due to the fact that she had to grow and do things on her own, which I had more guidance. And her dad was around and he helped out with her and, you know, got her going back at a good pace. So we're just grateful for her to 
not only come out of recovery, but to also just do these inspirational things. And I believe sky is the limit for her. She has a lot that she's been keeping inside and now she's releasing it. And it's a beautiful thing. So tell me, uh, as she was growing up or even more recently, how has writing played a role in her expression, in her recovery, in her just special creativity? Patricia has always been in a wonderful re uh, reader and writer, but especially when it comes to writing. That girl has always expressed her most vivid thoughts, even as a child. And I just couldn't believe a child could be capable of writing these things that were just compassionate, outrageous, just all these different emotions. And I remember she would have even uh, school projects and activities and they would be so passionate and they would just draw you inward, you know, into her writing. And you would just get lost in between words she was saying. And she made me feel like I hadn't even experienced the same loss because I'm seeing it through her eyes. So it's really good that she's able to write fiction, nonfiction. She just has a very uh, vivid imagination. And we're just so proud. And I know the book is going to do well because it's really, really interesting the way that she writes. It's impressive to be able to get into the mind of a character that's facing mental health challenges. So that's one thing that's really, as I was reading the book, I was, I was impressed by that. Um, have you read it yet? I'm like only on the first chapter. I just got the book about two days ago at her first book signing. And I was very excited. I didn't even want to put it down, but we've been planning this thing and so much has been going on. So I can't wait to sit back and just be able to read it all the way through. I don't think I'm going to stop. <laughs> it, it sounds like she waited to share it and didn't want uh, you to read it too soon. So that's uh, <laughs> good for you for, st uh, you know, uh, holding off. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just, I know that I'm not going to be prepared for everything that she has to say, but I do appreciate her realness. Even though she has imagination going on because the book is fiction, you know, but I, I know it comes also as an inspiration of some true events. So I know she has that imagination, like I keep saying, so it is going to be interesting to see which direction she took with different scenarios and events that happen in the book. Sheree, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me. Congratulations. And uh, it's it's fantastic that you're here supporting her on her big day. Hey, thank you, Cody. It's been nice interviewing with you, too. <laughs> Great. You have started something called the L.A. Local Authors Society, La La Society. Yes. Tell us what that is. That is Los Angeles Local Authors, and it's a chance to bring us all together and introduce ourselves to the city because it seems that, you know, film and television kind of rule Los Angeles, but there's a huge amount of literary talent in Los Angeles that kind of gets ignored, I think. We're changing that right now, just a little bit at a time. Um, and so I remember, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, you brought everyone together for a meeting and Patricia was there and she was able to say, hey, everyone, I, you know, I'm here, I'm a local author and I have my book celebration coming up. And, and now here we are. Yes. Well, I met Patricia at one of the first Walla events yeah. that I did with Amy Dresner at uh, Sam Piper Books in Torrance. So Patricia was there and she stayed even after Amy left. And um, had a really great conversation with her. And that's when I first met her and just was so attracted to her energy. She's just so vibrant and smart and in her skin. And I just admire her for being that young and that passionate and that creative and just doing it. And just how she went out and got this book deal and got this book out there is just unbelievably impressive. Yeah. It's an incredible story, and it's it's really impressive. Um, I remember I met her for the first time at the L.A. Festival of Books. I was there with Made in L.A. and then went a few booths down and found you at the La La Society booth with Patricia. So what was that like uh, hanging out together that day? So much fun. She's just alive and just so open and fun and funny and present. And so it was just a joy. She was there for both days. And on Sunday, it was just the two of us 
and it was lovely, just really lovely, and so excited for her book then, and people are just drawn to her, and, you know, very excited for her book, and now we're all here celebrating. It's great. So... I'm looking around the room and I see at least 100 people, if not more, uh, maybe maybe 200. Um, I'm not really good at counting in crowds. Um, but, you know, these types of events are so important for authors to reach their audience. I mean, well, and Patricia did this for herself. This is how smart she is. She was like, I'm going to have a premiere for my book. And how smart is that? So she did this all on her own. And that's again, she's just impressive. Good. So, Pete, thank you for sitting down and talking with me. Thanks for having um, me. So, we're here at Patricia Smith's book launch. Remember, how do you know Patricia? Uh, I've known her for uh, about a couple of years, or just about a year and a half, and just through friends of friends. And, and we met each other, and we kind of like had a instant connection in the sense that, like, I, I loved her energy. It was always like upbeat and high, and I relate to that because that's kind of how I operate. And so, we just sort of hit it off from there. It's amazing to see, and I, I, I identify with this, um, the focus on um, ambition and moving forward and overcoming sort of darkness when it rears its head in our lives. Um, and she's very, Patricia's very open about, um, about addiction and recovery and, um, and mental health challenges. And so it's fantastic that she's managed to, to, to do that as an author and also to be launching this book, which deals with some of those issues. Um, as a, as a, you're a creative person, you have a band it's called The Sweet Kill. Yep. And, and that's uh, The Sweet Kill. The essence of it is that there is a duality between the good side and the dark side of my being. It's sort of like Star Wars, the, the force. And then there's the dark side. And that's what The Sweet Kill is, is that there's the sweetness that everyone, every human being has been, in bor has been born with. And then there's the part of me that just wants to just, you know, like has a death wish that, um, that landed me into the rooms of recovery and got me into a point where I had to look at that and uh, what I love about Patricia and her demeanor is that she's so open in exposing the negatives in her life. She isn't going to, you know, be fluff about how the great the day is. She'll be very upfront and blunt about where she's at. And I think that that's how I operate as well. So we really relate to each other in that sense that we're able to be honest with each other. That's the key. And, and Present day. I still couldn't figure out exactly where I was. I was willing to say anything to see my dad. I was sitting on the sofa now, knees glued together, toes quietly tapping the white tiled ground. My hands gripped my knees, eyes down. Torsha, what's the last thing you remember about the accident? The police, I mumbled. Were you at the scene? I would have been dead too if I was. I looked up with the glare. Okay, so the police. I saw pictures though. I glanced down again, remembering my mom's crushed skull. Her eyes wide open. Piper had so much makeup on. She looked really good, Dad. I heard you refused to look at some, and you didn't, didn't identify them. I didn't need to. Someone else did. What did the police tell you? Why was I talking about something that happened five years ago? Was my family murdered? Did my dad have something to do with it? Was my dad in jail right now? Holy shit. No, I'm not doing this. No, I want to see my father. I have the right to see him. I got up and walked to the window and looked outside. As soon as we're done, you'll get to see him. I didn't recognize the street I was on. I'd been here before, though. Do you know why you're here? No, what are you investigating? My father? It was an accident. I was looking out the window. It was an accident, I said again, and put my hand up to the window. There was dried blood. It had mostly been washed off, but the outline of the stain was still there. I couldn't remember how... Who are you? I demanded, turning around. Elizabeth Smith, I'm a forensic psychiatrist. I was hired as a consultant for this case. I'm on your side, Portia. What is so fucking complicated about a car accident that happened five years ago where my little sister died at 16 and my mother at 42? It had been an accident. My dad blamed himself for months, but the police reassured him that it wasn't his fault. I started crying. That's not the case that I'm talking about. I looked at my hands. Blood on my kitchen floor. I tried to remember more. What the hell had happened? Sit down, Portia. I had done something. Something really bad. But I had no idea what it was. I, if you guys have questions, I'll take them. 
but it doesn't have to be that formal Q and A if you want. Does anyone have? Do you want to, Does anyone have a question? Alvin. Um, the most difficult part about writing this book was when I was rewriting the book and I got sober and I was writing about an alcoholic that smoked and drank every day and I like was writing about an old lifestyle and I wanted to go back and um, also Portia was stuck being the victim because I was stuck being the victim so when I grew my character grew and like we kind of grew together with this book so it worked out um how did i decide to write a mystery i didn't i don't decide genres i mean i just write what comes to my mind um because if i wanted to choose to write a, a genre i'd probably write romance but if people, i can't i tried they end up killing each other <laughs> As a 25 year old, I was 25 years old sharing a room with an 84 year old. I knew something was wrong there. And so I, I started writing about this girl and her father and this codependency and this like weirdness. And it was only, I know it took, it, that's how it started. And that's how all my books start. It always starts about a girl with one problem. And then it turns out a girl with a lot of problems. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so why am I so open about my mental health? It's just that what I like um for the girl on the other side that um because there I need I don't know how to say this. I need to let other people know that it's literally okay not to be okay and that there's no reason to have any shame about it and that I get help and that you should, other people should get help too if they need it. I'm a and she opened me up to it and I. This is hilarious. To never stop writing. Like, and yes. to just love it. And if you are in the middle of writing a book or want to write a book but can't decide, like, how to sit down and do it, what I do is just try sitting in front of the computer every day for like 10 minutes and just get your brain or your body to do that muscle memory of doing it every single day. Even if you don't write anything, like just, you have to train your brain to like, it's kind of like meditation. Like it's hard at first, but you kind of have to do it with me to be honest. Like I've been writing ever since I was a little girl. So I never really had problems with writing. Um, it's always about like getting it published and all that crap. Uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, writing. Did you? Can you tell us about the, the process of getting this book out there? Okay, this is a long story, Cody. Uh -huh. <laughs> and you know the story. That's why you're asking. <laughs> okay, so um, I read this book in 2017. When I was going when I was yeah when I was going through a dark time, and then I went through 12 drafts of it. And in the mix of those 12 drafts, I decided to go to New York and pitch this to an agent. All I wanted was an agent. This was a pipe dream. Like there was no way I thought I could get published, but I needed an agent. So I decided to spend money that I did not have and um, go to New York, a state I'd never been to before by myself and stay in a hostel. And it was the worst trip I've ever been on. I was crying. I was scared. I fell in trash. Um, I could not hail a taxi. And all I wanted to do was just get an agent. And so we went and it was like a, it was like a speed dating thing for uh, pitches. So like you had to do your research and I was doing research for six months. I had, six months of uh, pitch prepared, six months of which agents I'm going to go to and all that. And we, I get there, we're in line and every, the nervous energy in line, like everyone is trying to get an agent and we're just going over our pitches, like pacing back and forth, like practicing with each other. 
Not to mention, I had a group of friends there that told me that my pitch sucked. So not only was I in a state that I did not want to be in, I did not, I was not happy, but I also had a pitch that wasn't going to work. So I kind of felt like I just wasted a lot of money and I wanted to give up and go back home. And, uh, but like someone else had paid for the ticket for New York. So I couldn't like go back empty handed. I acknowledge them in the book. It's just a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Anyway, so I go to New York and I am waiting in line and this girl from Writer's Digest, it was a Writer's Digest in her conference, she goes in line and she goes, if anyone has a psychological thriller, there is one editor here that is willing to offer, like, is willing to hear your story and maybe offer a representation. And I was like, I don't think my a psychological thriller. I'm a young adult, but not a thriller. And someone else was like, no, you definitely have a psychological thriller because they've heard my shitty pitch. So um, I was like, okay. He's like, we can we can work with it. And you know what? Those four people, I don't know their names, and it sucks I don't know their names because they are the reason why I got this eligible. Because they literally helped me so much um, in that line, you know. And so I redid my pitch, and I was super nervous. I was in front of Chantel, which is my editor now, and I went to her first, and I was like, I'm just gonna wing it, you know, like. I'm not here for representation. I'm here for agent. So whatever. And she loved it. And she said, send me a full. And in writer's terms, that meant like send her the manuscript so they could see it. And then four months go by, nothing. So I'm like, great. <laughs> I got my hopes up for nothing. And then one morning, I woke up really late that day. And I got an email that day that they're willing to offer. Um, rem- oh, how did they say it? Offer representation. In Portia, I didn't think had an alcohol problem, even though she drank every day. Um, I, I just thought it was normal. And so when people talk about my book about it's about alcohol, I'm like it's, I didn't think so. Um, um, and so I was never gonna have her stop drinking. Like that was just not part of the plan. She was gonna be like just that's just gonna be her character. And um, but it's really hard for a character to grow when they're always drunk. And so I had to just. I don't know. I almost just said a spoiler. I can't say anymore. More unless you read it. <laughs> I almost said it. No spoiler. Okay. Okay. What else? Hold on. Keep 
going with writing or in life? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Okay, um, keep going with writing. I love writing, so I'll never stop. You can tell me my book sucks. You can tell me that, you know, it's not going to work out. I'm still going to write. Um, it's just part of who I am. So I'll never stop. I might take breaks here and there, and I might go through periods, but it'll always be a part of me. What kept going through Woo! other people, what kept going in life is, um, friends. Um, that's it. Moving on. Yes, got it. Okay, we know you're a force of nature. <laughs> what kept you, like, motivated? Like, what changed in your mind that was like, I can do this. I can get out of this funk and break this hole? Um, was it therapy? Was it, I know it was friends, but what, what, like, what else? You know? Uh, um, I think it was one day I, I was like, I wanted to die and I tried to overdose and I woke up again and it was just like, I can't, I can't do this anymore. I got to do something. Um, and then writing is easy, but I need, to, you know, to get up and like enjoy the world and like get help. I need to go to therapy. And what motivated for me that is I think, uh, my dad. Like I couldn't do that to him anymore. I think that I think that's what did it. So love, love, 